All right, everybody. Hey, it's Greg Myrock. I'm back here with Tony Olson. This is part three of Pottery Conversations on University of North Dakota School of Mines Pottery. And today uh, we're going to conclude our three-part series. We're going to talk about pricing and valuing University of North Dakota School of Mines Pottery. And I, you know, one of the things I usually talk with with my clients and my customers, I, I feel like there's four points that I look at to determine the value of a piece of pottery. And I haven't talked to Tony about these. He may have a totally different opinion. He may agree, but um, either way, we'll kind of talk through this and how it relates to UND. So the four things that I use or I look at when I'm looking at value are one, rarity. I think rarity of a pot is important. Um, obviously, there's one of a kind or it's a mass produced Roseville brown clematis is a lot different from a handmade piece of UND. Then desirability, right? It could be a one of a kind, but if it's, nobody cares, right? If there's no interest in it, that's a that's a, not gonna be a real valuable piece. And then obviously condition, right? Um, all things being equal, you'd prefer a, a better conditioned pot than a worse conditioned pot. But the same token, let's just, if you took this to like Roseville, right? A piece of Delarobia that's got some chips and some restorations on it, it's not gonna impact the value that much. Put that same damage on a piece of Roseville Freesia and the value is probably half of what it would be for a mint example. Um, and then kind of the fourth point I want to kind of talk about as it relates to UND is probably quality or the aesthetics of a piece of pottery, right? Like um, Tony and I were talking a little bit uh, before we got on camera here about UND and the base that I have has got a big lean to it. Um, you know, that's a poor quality piece of pottery, so it's going to have less value. So those are a couple couple things we'd like to talk through a little bit today. Um, so Tony, I guess with that, like, what do you think about those four points? You agree with those, or how, how do you yeah, how do you look at value? With all that, but I think UND by and large is the hardest art pottery to price because because um, you know with um, the amount of stuff out there, and there's a lot of it. Um, they had more. Um, let's face it, there's more lousy stuff than there are good stuff. Yeah. Students made this stuff. Students took a class, made a pot, brought it home, passed it down through the generations. Then uh, the grandkids got it. They said, "I'm going to put it on. I'm going to put it on eBay or Etsy or any of these other sites that they sell on." And it's but ugly, but it does have the UND stamp. Uh, for example, um, um, on any given day, like today. If you were to go on eBay, um, you could find some really bad pottery that um, has the UND mark on it that they're asking a tremendous amount of money for. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, there's one on there now they're asking $4,000 for. Yeah. Quite possibly could be the ugliest piece of UND ever. <laughs> Well, you know what? And, and and that causes confusion, right? Because then I feel yeah. like these new collectors, it's like you see that you see a similar pot for five hundred dollars and you see this thing priced at four thousand. And at some point, if you're a new collector, you're like you, you just don't want to be you just want a fair value. You don't want to be taken advantage of. So you see that and you're like and it just gets to the point like, you know what? I'm just not going to buy anything because I don't have a good feel for this. And I think you're absolutely right, because I've sold a ton of UND and I you know, a lot of times I'll come to you like, hey, what do you think this is worth? And like you know, and you got one opinion, I got a different one and a buyer might have a third opinion, but I think it's, I think you're exactly right about how complicated it is. Cause the other thing is th there's, there's different qualities, but there's so many different styles, right? Like, it's not yeah. like you can take, you know, a Rookwood painted mat, you can compare 50 of those, but like with U and D there's so many different styles and you can't make those same kind of comparisons. You can't find 10, 10 examples of this of a very similar base that's sold in the last 10 years yeah and, and a lot of times you know the big auction houses haven't helped but they um when they first started to sell school of mines pottery they would have a und production piece and those are all done in a mold the marks in a mold everything's in a mold they're used normally monochromatic so they're one color and they advertise it as finely carved. Well, yeah. it wasn't finely carved. Yeah. But it was in the, that was when they first started to sell it. So first of all, it's not finely carved. It's not signed by the potter. 
uh, none of the things they describe it as were true. Right. So right. people are thinking, heck, this is, this is a one of a kind when hundreds of that same pot were made right. and sold uh, in the 19, you know, from 1939 in the next to 1949, uh, this uh, uh, Spencer went around a tri-state area selling pots, their production stuff to um, uh, flower shops and gift stores and so on. He would take an order, the university would ship the pot to the, the flower shop and they would sell it. And he and that's how they sold their production stuff. Well, when when um, the auction houses started to get these things, they look some of them look incredibly like they were, um, you know, hand done, but they weren't. Yeah. Yeah. And so, how much do you pay for that? Well, first of all, you don't know what you're bidding on, so be careful. Right. Now, if you do get a one of a kind, now recently. I'll hold this up. Recently, this sold on eBay. This is a coyote vase, and this is hand carved. Okay, and you can see the carving marks on it, and it's done by Julia Matson, and it's a nice little pot. And this sold um, for eight hundred dollars. Well, that's about what they should go for. Yeah. So are, they, are, are all those examples hand carved, or is that a, are those molded as well? Some are, some are molded, and some are carved. Um, How do you know the difference just because of the well just it's you can see the tool marks. Okay. You know, and on a on a production piece, you can't. It's yeah. but on this piece, if you look carefully, you can see the tool marks. Yeah. There. Yeah. That's okay. a great base. That and it's a it's a it's a it's a super nice little pot. And um they did a buys in the same way that I showed you my grandson has. Yeah. Uh, some were some were molded and some were sometimes the mold it came out of the mold it didn't look good and according to the um, instructors they said that they they would um you know go over it and, oh. and try to try to make it make it more defined now i i had you know i've heard that um but i don't know if it's true or not but um but you know a one of a kind uh, a piece that is so all of the production pieces, you know, in the early days, production pieces were very hard to come by. I mean, I I really craved trying to get those. One time um, um, I uh, met a, a collector and he wanted to sell everything he had. And he had a lot of production stuff and nice production stuff. You know, he had an ox cart vase. He, oh, had, wow. he had all of these production pieces. And um, so I agreed to meet him at a coffee shop in Fargo. Marilyn was at home in Jamestown. And, you know, I, I, you know, I don't have real money, but, but I had good credit. So I told Marilyn to pick up, and it, it came to maybe $20,000. Oh, wow. So I told Marilyn, I said, go to the bank, get $20,000, drive to Fargo, meet me there. <laughs> and I'm going to buy this pottery at a coffee shop. How long ago was this? This was, you know, maybe 20 years ago, 15. Okay. Yeah, so that was... A you know, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of this stuff was still pretty expensive. And he was tough. I mean, he had his prices in mind. And he wasn't, he wasn't the type of person you could negotiate with. So okay. you either wanted it or you didn't. Well, I bought it all, you know. How many pieces was that collection? Um, you know, believe it or not, it was only about 20 pieces because oh, wow. some of them were one of a kind and, you know, one pot was worth $8,000. Okay. So those would have been molded production pots. Yeah. Well, most of them were. But so there why were they one of a kind? How did that end up being a one of a kind pot if it's a molded pot? They just well, made all of them weren't, all of them weren't production. So there were about five pots that were um, individually one of a kind, hand painted, hand carved, hand thrown pieces. Okay. And those five pieces covered what I paid for everything. Okay. Um, okay. There was a piece. Um, there are two really main main um, student potters that I I thought were every bit as good as you know um, um, 
Cable and Matson and so on. There was uh, there was uh, Ruchnell that yeah. we talked about in the other episode. Yeah, and a woman by the name of Irene Nelson. Now Irene Nelson was there pretty much the same time Schnell was, but she did some spectacular. I pieces. had some pots by Nelson. Yeah, she said she had some spectacular pieces, and so I bought like three of hers, and um, they were just wonderful. And so those, and I sold them all, you know, I never, and again, you know, I mean, I sold every one of those pots. The only one of those pots that I still have is that Bettonite. This pot is the only one of that group I still have, but I, sold, but I sold this. And then the people that bought it from me um, put it at auction at um, in Cincinnati. And then I bought it back in Cincinnati and now I have it. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Hey, so let's talk about condition a little bit because it's interesting. Um, you know, I've I have always taken condition very seriously, and I notice like more and more auction houses like are not providing any condition reports at all, or you got to ask. And then and then there's a lot of folks that I know, dealers and some auctioneers and stuff. They're like nobody cares about repairs, Greg. No, like, cause I'm, I'm a little, you know, I'm an, I have an engineering degree. I'm a little anal about some things. And, and while I recognize that, like, and what I was trying to say is, you know what, like, I agree to some extent that like, again, back to a piece of Del Roby or really not a nice piece of UND, if there's restoration on it, it doesn't necessarily affect the value that much, but you want to know about it, right? You want to know that you're buying a repaired pot. And I feel like I, I've had, several people really make that argument with me. I'm not going to name names because I, I totally disagree in my opinion. Like I feel like, again, like if, if it's something's repaired, you want to disclose it. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, maybe it's having less of an impact on value these days, just because there's fewer and fewer examples of pottery out there and more and more of it does have restoration. But what's your thoughts about condition? And how uh, it's, value? In condition is, it, that's why it's, it's tough to buy on some of the, a big yeah. platforms because um, a lot of these people don't aren't pottery people and they don't know how to look for a right. crap right. or a chip or so on and so they they call it mint. Now, I, just in the past year, I bought two pieces of UND on on um, eBay and they both came damaged. Yeah. Okay, so I had to send them back and then having to go through that whole thing. I remember talking to you and your wife about it at supper that night in the fall about this pot I bought that came yeah. crap and they wouldn't yeah. take it back. Yeah. And I had to go through the whole process with eBay to get, to get them to take it back. Now, eBay credit, they they do support the seller or the buyer in most yeah. cases. Yeah. But no, don't buy damaged stuff unless it's super rare. Yeah. It's rare and you get it repaired. Now, I once bought a probably a, the biggest piece of UND I've ever seen. It was graduated colors. It was arts and crafts design. Um, it was beautiful, but it had about a two inch chip on the rim. Well, I had it, I bought it anyways, cause it was big and it was pretty. And I got it repaired and I could not tell yeah. where the repair was. Yeah. And I even took a black light and I couldn't find it. So I don't know how they do that, but. Well, uh, and I think in, some, in cases like that, that, you know, and again, I think it goes back to the, the, the rarity played into that, the desirability of the pot played into that and the aesthetics that it was a beautiful piece of pottery. And then at that point, you know, the condition becomes less of an issue, but it, you want to just know about that. And that needs to factor into the, into the value of the equation. In but my some opinion. people, you know, um, um, with some pots, if it has a little roughness around the bottom or or, or that type of stuff, um, you know, pottery is pottery. It's fragile, yeah. you know, and if it's a beautiful pot, I, I accept that kind of thing. And but if it's you know, glaze, it's kind of crazing, you know, crazing is to be expected on a glazed piece of pottery and, you know, yeah. like, you know, cra crazing matters in Rookwood. Yeah. But crazing doesn't matter in UND. Right. You know, I mean, it just depends on the type of pottery, too. Right. But uh, yeah, try to buy the best you can, um, the best you can afford um, with the best condition you can get. Yeah. But um, but at the same time, 
it's the larger platforms, the internet platforms, selling platforms that are ruining it for people that are trying to educate themselves about UND. Yeah. And the auction house used to not help when they didn't do their due diligence and trying to identify a piece of pottery yeah. and how rare it was. But um, right now you can go on and you can see uh, ridiculous prices on School of Mines pottery and you shake your head and you just say, what are they talking about? Now I got an email asking how much uh, from a, a fellow collector asking how much a piece of pottery was. It wasn't this, that long ago. It was a production piece of Wendy pottery. It had a Viking ship on it. Yeah. It was monochromatic. Um, people were asking, the owner was asking how much it was. People were telling them. I thought it was worth, you know, four to six hundred dollars. You you actually I think that guy contacted me about me buying. I think I offered him four hundred for it or something like that. He said he had and, I, and I said, you know, at best eight hundred. And then I see it ends up on the internet for like three thousand dollars. And I'm going, well, how do you get from here to here? Because so wasn't that like a four or five hundred dollar pot? Isn't it four or yeah. five hundred bucks? Yeah. Yeah, and they're asking three, four thousand. Yeah. Now, how does it get from talking to experts, you know, you're not out to screw anybody. So when people ask you for a price, you they they got to know that you're going to make some money, but you're not going to be making $3,000 on a piece right. of pot. Right. So you're, you know, that yeah, works. That's, well, and that's what happens too, is then it, on the flip side, then somebody else sees that and say, hey, I got one of those and they'll contact you and they'll try to sell it. And I'll say, hey, I'll give you 400 bucks. They're like, there's one on eBay for 3,000. I'm like, yeah, well, it's been there for, It'll be there for two years, but it's just it just creates a lot of confusion, you know. And I, I totally yeah. and years years ago I made the mistake. A guy had a piece of pottery listed. It had a chip on it. It was it was an average piece of UND with an average design. It was worth maybe two or three hundred dollars. And with the chip, it was worth literally fifty bucks. Yeah. I email and he had a price of like three thousand dollars on it. And I emailed them and I said, this is, um, I just want to save you a little, you know, embarrassment, but this pot is worth X amount plus it's damage. It probably, you probably should find somewhere else to sell it. And I got ripped. Yeah. He responded to me and mind your own blinkety blink business. You don't know what you're talking about. I've asked experts about this piece of pottery and they told me this. So you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, okay. Yeah. You know, so I made that mistake. I'll never do it again. Yeah. I, no. I try to, you know, I mean, people are going to price stuff. It's just like if I have something for sale, I had a McCoy umbrella stand I sold yesterday. And I mean, it was, a, I thought it was a nice piece, sold it for 575 bucks. I literally had a guy offer me 150 bucks for it couple weeks before that and I said you know what I just said no thanks I didn't say anything I'm like okay if you think I've got this for 575 do you really think I'm gonna sell for 150 dollars you know yeah. but then he wrote back again telling me how well you know even in 30 years this will never be worth your asking price and blah 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 so I actually then I thought okay well let's look I need to then I thought I'm gonna look into this a little bit so I did a little research and I found oh I found one that sold for 500 and I found another one that sold for 475 in the last couple of years I thought well it's definitely a good piece. And then lo and behold, the next day it sold to somebody else, you know? So like everybody's got their opinions and I, I feel like um, I, I, do. I agree with what you're saying. It is a disservice when people are so far off in pricing, but you know. And that's why before, you know, and, and I don't want to say don't buy on eBay or Etsy because I sell on Etsy, you know, Yeah. but um, just do your research before yeah. you do. Yeah. Do your research because um it's the ones that don't do their research that, you know, people see it for sale for X amount of money and they think, well, that's what it's worth. Well, no, no. I mean, there are ways to, now I've never bought these, these, um, these platforms that tell you about what similar items have sold. Uh, yeah. You may have those, I can't remember what the name of them are, but yeah. I have friends that belong to them and they swear by it. Yeah. So, you know, they pay 30 bucks a month to see what it's gone for. Now, that, I think that's valuable. But I also go to, but I have, I would say, I've been doing this for over 35 years. 
I keep track of prices religiously, almost annually. It's just, I want to know what stuff sold for it, where it sold. Keep a spreadsheet or what do you keep? Like a table? Oh, the spreadsheet is right here. Okay. That's my spreadsheet. I don't know. Like I, I've sold, I used to do that, but I've sold way too much stuff. I can't remember what I paid for something last week sometimes. No, but that's you. I mean, you, you, you sell hundreds and thousands of pieces of pottery. I don't. I'm a, I'm just a, a you know, a, a collector slash dealer yeah. that has a limited amount of stuff in his brain. But, um, you know, but there are similar pieces, you know, that come around and you've seen this and I know all the auction houses have seen this um, where they get a really good piece and it goes crazy one day at auction a hundred thousand dollars for a piece of Newcomb or a piece of whatever. And um, then 10 years later, they want to sell it and get rid of their stuff. And it brings, you know, half that. That's the thing I struggle with. Like, when, cause you know, we, I mean, quite honestly, like I compete against a lot of those auction houses for these collections. And like, just the other, a few months ago, there was a piece of Rookwood that a gentleman was wanting to sell it to me. And I, I offered him $1,400 for it. It was a standard glaze, Native American piece of Rookwood and offered him 1400 bucks. And he goes to one of the auction houses. So, well, they're, they're going to ask, and he comes back, so they're going to estimate it for two to 3000. And I said, well, you know what? I said, ask them to give you 1400 bucks for it. And yeah, he, he ends up sell, giving the piece to the auction house and it, it opens at a thousand dollars and it sold for that opening bid. And so then he gets back to me and says, well, you know, then I, they charged me 25%. So he ends up with 750 bucks on that piece of pottery that I was offering 1400 for. And, you know, um, I feel like there's just that appeal that you think you, you want to hit that home run. So you're thinking, okay, I'm going to consign this piece and it's going to go through the roof and set this record for whatever it is, or, you know, get a lot of all this bidding activity. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Right. So it's like you, and it, and then that is such a weird business too. You got to just be careful, even when you're looking at prices realized from the auctions, because there's a lot of weird things that go on with that as well. So it's like, you know, you know really, these guys, the legitimate ones, you know, that, and there's plenty of them and they're, we all know who they are. They're, they, they've done this a long time and they yeah. sell about everything. And, and they've gotten to the point where a lot of them, um, they estimate, their estimates are low on the low end. Yeah, the open bid is on the low end. They want people to get involved. Yeah, and, then, and wherever it goes, it goes. You know, yeah. but at the same time, you know, as a as a bidder, um, it's tough to bid at, on these sites now because you're competing with people that pretty much have more money than me, and plus the buyer's premium have gotten um, pretty high, so ridiculous that, and then you got to pay for shipping and. And you're adding all this up. And so if you're thinking you're going to pay, let's say, I'll pay $5,000 for this pot. But then when you get the buyer's premium and the shipping, 30%. Up to be, yeah, it's, it's end up to almost $10,000. Well, you, you want to be able to pick the stuff up too, right? Because I feel like the shipping is what like kills me because I bought stuff where I'm thinking, oh, I got a decent deal on something. A lot for 200 bucks for a vase. And then shipping's $165 for a eight inch piece of pottery. And I, I know there's a cost to that. I know somebody's got to pick it up, but like that, yeah, that kills me. But so I, I, guess, I, still, I still enjoy buying. Yeah. And so, but I'm very selective at what I buy anymore. Yeah. But um, that's why if I see a piece of UND that I haven't seen or that's unique, then it's, then it's going to be probably pretty valuable. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, so let's circle back to that, so this this whole uh, UND valuation and pricing thing. So, um, you know, I, I guess when you look at, like, the desirability, if you think about the, the teachers at UND, so is, is there one or two that are the most valuable, or is it just, like, or do you base it more on, you know, the quality or the aesthetics of the pot, or, or like... Uh, well, yeah, you know, quite honestly, I'd rather have a piece from... Um, Cable, uh, Hildegard, uh, Freed, um, uh, Flora, Huckfield, any of those. I'd rather have a, a teacher or a, yeah. 
piece from there. A good all, piece. Things being, all things being all equal. Things being equal. Right? But there are students that did exceptional work, even students you've never heard of, like I, I showed you yesterday, this vase. This is by a woman um, that uh, she just signed a DK, okay? Well, that's that's as good a piece as you're gonna find. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've seen two of these, like I told you in that story the other day. Every inch of its card, this is, looks like enamel, and it almost looks, has a very Asian feel to it. It's it's um, just outstanding vase. Well, this is done by a student. And I think I identified the student, but I had to have to go back to the Miller book to check out who it is. But again, um, you'll find pieces by students that are just outstanding. You know, here's Schnell, you know. Yeah. I mean, just outstanding, you know. So these are every bit as good as a cable or a Matson or, or whoever. So when you get into a vase like that, how do you put a price tag on a vase like that? Yeah, like, well, because you know, if you, like if you're looking at, if you look at the rarity, it checks that box. You look at the desirability of the pot. I think that is a highly collectible piece of pottery. You look at the, you know, I'm assuming the condition, knowing you, I'm assuming the condition's mint. And then it's a very, you know, the, the quality is definitely there. So, you know, if that piece is like, what is that, you know, is that a yeah. $3,000 piece or what well, is that? Yeah, I mean, like I, uh, the green one that I just held up, um, I know one of the, the East Coast auction houses sold a similar one, yeah, taller, and it went for twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, I've tried to sell it for four thousand yeah. dollars. You know, at, our, at the arts and craft show, yeah, yeah. and I haven't had any takers. But I'm not going to sell it for less than that. Yeah, uh, I know what I paid for it, and even at that, I'm not making any, yeah. I'm not making any money. But I just chose. You know, at the same time, and now I don't. You know, I don't know if I'll sell it or not. But none of this do you know? You know what it, you paid for it, and the good pieces, none of them are cheap. So very seldom do you find a piece. But there are people out there that have vast, larger, and better collections than I have, and they have some outstanding pots that um, just blow me away. That. I mean, I've seen hand done Viking ships by Matson and a in a colleague's um collection that is all hand carved. I've seen um football players surrounding a vase, a tall vase, uh with almost Heisman esque, you know, cool. uh, you know, from the and you know, but I will say it does matter in most cases, the time period of the pot. Kind of dictates the quality of i mean oh. the best pots that i've seen come from the teens because they're you know they're normally like van briggle same way with van briggle then early. yeah they're normally arts and crafts looking they're they're um they're in heavily influenced by the the other um, arts and crafts pottery companies and the 20s were a great year for them and then in the 30s uh UD started to go towards more of the of the regional themes in pottery like bison and, and coyotes and, and prairie roses and, you know, um, past flowers and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But even the 30s are good. Now, once you hit the 40s, then things became, uh, there are very few hand done pieces from the yeah. 40s, except the only exceptions are are the two students that I mentioned. So no, they made a lot of pieces in the 40s that were really, really Yeah, good. they did theirs in the 40s. So, but you know, those those tiles I showed you um, of the uh, woman archer, now that was done in the 1930s, okay? And women, and Matson did those for women in sports, which were there, very few women in sports, okay? I mean, women had only gotten the vote 10 years earlier. Yeah. I mean, so the fact, yeah. and 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 men were not recognizing women's sports, especially in college, and so the fact that they exist is a big deal, and the fact that Julie Matson thought it was important that they have something, yeah, was cool as well. So those, when you find something like that, that's a treasure. That's very cool. Yeah. Hey, so um, I guess one thing I was going to ask you, and then we'll kind of wrap this thing up here after this, but like. Um, so, 
you know, how, how do you value or what do you see the difference in value between a, a molded piece versus a hand thrown piece? Or do you think there is any, any different? And I know a lot of people like a handmade piece of pottery versus a molded piece of pottery. Well, um, you know, all molded pieces aren't uh, made the same. Yeah. You know, for example, um, in the, in the vases we've talked about, there are some molded pieces that they sold, um, you know, in the tri-state area and in Montana and so on, that this A.E. Spencer sold that just aren't very good. And I wouldn't buy them at really any price. Yeah. And there are other production pieces that are outstanding. The Indian and Travois vase is an outstanding vase and it's in a matte green and a matte brown. Well, I had the green and, you know, I mean, there's, and it was an incredible vase, that big ox cart vase. Now those vases go for, for example, I sold the ox cart vase in green for $4,000 because I had never seen it in green before. I'd only seen it in, in brown or tan, okay? Because most of those pieces were monochromatic, mm -hmm. the production stuff. Yeah. Well, one color. So, um, but for the most part, the higher priced items are individually made um, by important artists, by yeah. important potters. And you can tell if it's, um, if it's a beautiful pot, you can tell. This is a beautiful, for example, this is a beautiful pot. Yeah. So, so really you have three different, you basically have a molded pot that's just mold, molded, no hand work at all. You have right. a molded pot that could be hand carved or hand decorated, sort of right. a second classification. Then you can have a hand thrown, hand decorated pot. Right. So, you know, is there obviously just molded with no artistic touch to it at all? That's going to be a lesser quality pot. When you get into molded with hand decoration, you know, assuming it's everything else is equal, is that comparable to that value to a hand thrown, hand decorated pot, or is sort of the the holy well, grail for UND collections would be a hand thrown, hand decorated piece? Well, the most expensive pieces of UND that I've seen are molded pieces, large, yeah, hand decorated and hand painted by a teacher, yeah. Okay, so um, the um, uh, large um, um, flicker tail base um, that went for $36,000 in a California auction. Yeah. That's a molded piece. It's not hand thrown, but it's carved from head to foot. Yeah. With, you know, large gophers surrounding the vase with wheat stalks and so on. And that's by cable. So that's. How tall is that vase? That. I think at least 18 inches. Oh, wow. Because UND made, like, more so than most other potteries, they made a lot of small pottery. It's well, small most pieces. of it was small. You very seldom find big ones. But there are other larger pots, high glazes from the early 20s, 1921, 22, 23, that area, that are um, art deco and design or arts and crafts that sell in the sixteen to $18,000 range. But again, they're molded pieces. They're not hand thrown. Yeah. But the pot I told you about that I owned, the bison vase, it was hand thrown, decorated, betonite, and bison. So yeah. to me, it was the perfect pot. And, um, you know, uh, you have a picture of it. I should send you it again. Yeah. So yeah. So the yeah that's a great know. pot. It's a great pot. You know. Hey, so uh, again, I don't don't want to want to be respectful of your time and you have to wrap this thing up here. But so, is there any? Uh, you know, we've done three of these now. So, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you want to like tell to a new a new U and D collector? Well, um, just do your research. You know, yeah. like I said before, there are books, and so go looking for them. You can go on, you know, you can go on Amazon and buy any of these books. So I would. Yeah recommend Ken Forster's book of comparative studies, um, Dakota Potteries by Darlene Dummel, uh, Ralph and Terry Covell, you know, American Art Pottery. My mother gave me that book for my birthday. It cost $60 back in the day. And that was an expensive book, but oh, it's, yeah. it's been invaluable to me. Yeah. You know? and they, I, I, will, 
I will try to get a link to the books and yeah everything else we've talked about to on the on our show notes for this so to help people find stuff so. yeah, but but you know that's do your research before you spend the money because once you spend the money and you got a pot on the shelf that you hate <laughs> you know um, that's not a very good feeling because it's happened oh. many times yeah. you know where i thought why did i buy that yeah but for the most part um i have why didn't i buy it yeah or why didn't I buy it? Then why did I buy it? Yeah. So. Well, the good thing about that is, you know, as long as you're smart about what you're buying, typically you can get out of it without too much hurt. I think, you know, where I see people getting burned is when it goes back to condition, right? Like they're, they're, they get stuck with a, something that they think was meant and it's poorly repaired. I see that as the, you know, I don't, there's not a lot of, you know, they're not dealing with a lot of reproductions in UND. So if you end up making, you know, if you, if you look at the rarity, the desirability, the aesthetics of the pot, if you can check those boxes off, as long as you're knowing what you're buying condition wise, you can, you can figure this out fairly quickly. But I do go back to what you're saying. I think you're right. I mean, UND is very, very difficult to price because it's coming in all shapes, sizes, quality. And there is not like, you know, sure, bent night sort of fits in a box, but then once you get out of that, there's a ton of variability in what they made. Yeah, and in by and large, um, people are smart. They can look at a piece of pottery and say whether they think it's pretty or not. Yeah. Whether it's cool, whether it has a great shape or a unique form. You said something yesterday or the other day when we had our other talk. Um, I don't remember how you said it, but basically the message was if you're if you look at it, you didn't say this, but if you look at it, it looks like a turd, it is like right, like trust trust your judgment. I don't remember how you said it, but it was but very well do said. Do not buy a, a piece of UND based on the stamp on the bottom. Yeah. Do not value it based on the stamp on the bottom. Yeah. You know, I mean, by and large, people get that. But uh, do your research and at the same time, um, ask, don't be afraid to email people and ask people. Yeah. I mean, you and I both, you know, we've sold stuff. Anybody who ever wants to return something from me that I've sold, I yeah. just, I just return it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and that, yeah, very, I mean, you have to, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a small world, right? With this stuff, it's did, like, like, yeah, I mean, we take stuff back. I've told people like we take it back because it's smaller, bigger, bluer, whatever than you thought it was, whatever, whatever it is, issue is we take it back. Heck, I even had it. Now this was a little bit unique. I don't do this normally. But I had sold a piece of Natsler, which you know Natsler, right? Oh, yeah. Sold a piece of that. Well, maybe Natsler. Sold it like five years ago. I sold it five years ago. This guy, you know, he bought it five, and then five years later, he contacts me. He says, hey, you know, um, a couple people told me this is fake. I had, he goes, and I said, who was it? We had, I had a couple people that said it was real. And then one, I, one legitimate person said it was real. One legitimate person I know thought it was fake. I did, it was five years later. I told the dude, I said, just send it back. I'll give you your money back. Now, I don't normally do that. But in that case where there was some question on the authenticity of the piece, right. I took it back. And I guess just to say that is, you know, one thing that bugs me is people that think they know everything about some of this stuff. Yeah. There are new things coming out about any of this pottery, even to this day. So the other thing, I would be a little careful of the people that think they know everything because there's always new stuff coming out. Yeah, and 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 you know, it's like in in medicine, get a second opinion. Yeah, you know, get a second opinion. You know, nobody's out to, you know, and that's why I value the, you know, my mentors like Bob Barr and Darlene Dummel and people like that, because they they share the information they had at the time, and they're not worried about you finding something that they're not going to find. They're just. Yeah. They're uh, beautiful people, and Con and Sandy Short were the same. Great collectors, um, very willing to share what they know, and not worry about anything else. You know. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because that's one of the reasons why I started this pottery conversation, this podcast, video interviews, whatever you want to call it. Because I, you know, I hear a lot of people telling me like, "Hey, you know, people don't go to people. People don't want to subscribe to the." journal this american art party so you know people aren't doing that people aren't going to shows people aren't reading books people don't have younger people don't have an attention span for this stuff which i, I get that 
I sort of fall in that same trap myself. I'm I'm not one that's sitting down reading books that much anymore. And I feel like if we don't do something like what you know you and I are doing today, where we're getting some of the knowledge that you have and giving that a chance to get to the next generation of collectors, there won't be future generations of collectors if we don't get the backstories and the histories of und and these other pottery companies yeah and you know i don't know everything and by i mean there are uh, und collectors out there that have been doing this longer and know much more than i do i'm just basing it on 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 yeah. my experience you know and the people yeah. I know who have shared stuff and collectors but at the same time and i'm sure i'll get an email saying that he's full of crap or, or whatever oh, oh, so I'm sure I will, Tony. I get emails that I'm full of crap and I'm this and I'm that. It's just part of what we're doing and yeah. I don't really care, right? Nor do you. That's why I started with you, Tony, because I thought Tony's a little bit like me. He's not going to worry. I don't, yeah, look, man, we are, you know, our opinions are as good as the next person's and, and that's I what got our opinions. So, yeah, but at the same time, you know, with all these other potteries, and I know you're going to talk to other people, other experts, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm not just a UND guy. I mean, I love uh, studio pottery, American studio pottery. I love all the um, American art pottery. Now, I haven't dealt in it like you have, and you don't find much American art pottery in, in North Dakota. Yeah. I mean, other than UND. But, you know, I mean, um, for example, Rookwood, you know, it's been tough to, as much as I love it, um, you got to, you know, there's a lot to absorb with Rookwood. Oh, yeah. You know, there really is. And, and, and the other potteries like, you know, the Gruby and Tico and all those, those are fabulous pieces. But again, very seldom do you find it there. Now, since I moved to Colorado, I, all of a sudden I've been finding um, find a lot more stuff out that way, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. I just, I just have a big, I have a, I was going to get a hold of you. I have a big collection that's shipping to me that came out of, out of the, Denver area here recently too. So yeah, there's quite a bit of stuff out that way. I actually bought my first big collection out of Utah. I heart Utah is one state because you know I I have I go a long ways for these pottery collections, but Utah was a state that it was during right when COVID started. I had a big collection that I was coming out of uh, Salt Lake City and ended up not being able to go because of COVID. Um, but that was one of my first trip into Utah for a collection. And I just got another nice collection coming out of Utah. So there's there's good collections out that way. Yeah, Utah's not that far away. Well, let no. me know if you need me to look at something for you. Denver. Yeah, for me sure. For me. All right, well, Tony, I appreciate it. I, I, huh. uh, I want to be respectful of your time and our viewers' times and uh, as well. So thank you very much for doing this. I will uh, get this stuff up on the website we'll post on youtube and a couple other of other social media sites and then um, i'll share links with um, some of the things that tony and i've talked about hopefully help folks out and tony i may tony and i may be back to do one of these maybe on shire i see some good pieces of shire back there i know one of those came from me we could definitely follow up on a talk like that uh, with some studio pots uh, and, and who knows what else might come up so tony thank you very much i appreciate your time buddy all right. Nice talking to you. Thank you, sir. We'll see you.